The Diplomacy Dojo is a weekly discussion led by your board brother about diplomacy tactics and strategies. Let's listen in on what our players are discussing this week. We've got a couple people here today. So we've got David, Mike, and Ronnie. Hello, fellas. Hi, Blake. One of the things that I have been interested in for a while was talking about diplomacy variants. I suppose given the reference level of most people that find their way to my blog, a lot of them may not necessarily even be aware of the concept of diplomacy variants or why they would want to play them. In my mind, the first the threshold thing to understand about diplomacy variants is that when Cal Hammer created the game of diplomacy, he created a, a rule set for playing a game as well as a particular map for playing it. And with the passage of time, we can maybe say that diplomacy is more like a genre of games in addition to being a particular game, because there's so many ways to apply the same basic game design rules and concepts, but to reimagine the board or to change some rules slightly to make it into a different game that's still part of the same genre. Sure, yeah. Um, there, are, there are variants that are, are just very simple tweaks on either rules or maps all the way to variants, which some people might not even consider diplomacy, but have the same sort of mechanics involved. Like, yeah, it's not necessarily even movement, but simultaneous play by the players and therefore, you know, the opportunities for uh, double crossing as opposed to, you know, a turn framework like chess or risk or something like that. As far as that goes, I mean, obviously the easiest thing for the beginner to wrap their head around are map variants or if there are changes to the rules, there's sort of very simple changes like what's known as chaos builds or uh, also known as build anywhere, where you can, you know, instead of building only in your home center, you can build in any owned supply center that can change the game a lot. But it's also something that's very simple to conceptualize. And there are plenty of variants that are only map variants or that have very simple rules changes. And there's really, there's a variant out there for everybody. There have been, you know, variants almost since the game began. In fact, the rule book has variants for less than seven players. And there are literally thousands of variants uh, uh, out there, and perhaps dozens of them are actually good. Most of them are junk, but most of everything is junk. So that's par for the course. I think that's a great summary and explanation and maybe to somebody who's unfamiliar with the concept of variants gunboat diplomacy is a variant uh, it's probably the most popular variant as far as i know if it's your first time hearing about the idea of gunboat diplomacy that's when the players may not speak to each other in words or send messages they can still communicate but it's through the movement of their pieces well that's a major change to the original game rules where the players are supposed to be right. and talk and that can be combined with other variants. So you could have a you could have a totally different map, but also say we're going to play gunboat rules. And so you're not just changing the map, but also changing the major rule. And if you combine and mix and match some of these things together, you can get a pretty different game experience from the classic out of the box diplomacy rules. And I suppose for for players like us that have played the game so long, and you've played the game years and years, and you've played hundreds of matches. <laughs> you want to spice it up a little bit, <laughs> try try something different, even if you still want to play diplomacy. And then there is the question of just how good, quote unquote, the original map is. It has issues. I personally dislike stalemate lines, so I prefer to play and to design variants where stalemate lines are minimized. You know, the importance of stalemates is minimized. They're either harder to get to or... In a few cases, they're completely absent. And there are various ways to do that in, in map design. You can have wraparound maps as, you know, if your map is a globe or a cylinder, there aren't any corners. You can have a lower density of supply centers, thereby making movement more fluid. And stalemate lines are harder to form. The build anywhere, the chaos build rule is another way to do that. If you, if you think about it, all of those stalemate uh, in standard where it doesn't work if Power X has a fleet in the Mediterranean or in the Atlantic. Those are all gone. That's a great starting point for why someone would contemplate a variant of diplomacy. In my opinion, 
for a game designer who had not a huge amount of experience designing games, it blows my mind that diplomacy stands the test of time as a even somewhat balanced game that, that people still want to play. A lot of the older games from that era are ridiculously imbalanced in favor of one side of another or another strategy. But after all these years, it's still true that like some countries are weaker than others or that there's limitations with stalemate lines and things like that. That's something that I really like about exploring variants because I have, I have interest in game design in general. And so contemplating how a variant board, for instance, can be balanced while still preserving the idea that each country is unique, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. Hey, uh, like there's a variant, the ancient Mediterranean variant, that's uh, got five powers. It's a five-player game where there are these countries that surround the Mediterranean like a bowl. And even though each is unique and it's not a symmetrical board, the design behind it is pretty thoughtful in the sense that no one power stands out as significantly better than the other four or worse. I think that's kind of neat. Those sorts of things tend to work themselves out if the board is relatively balanced. Uh, and that's true of standard as well. Granted, there are powers that are generally regarded as weaker, let's say Austria or Italy, powers which are generally regarded as stronger you know, France, Germany, Russia. But, you know, once you uh, get a, a large enough batch of data in and people know about the weaknesses and strengths, players who are knowledgeable will compensate for that. They'll play to contain France more than they will play to contain Italy. And the board becomes more balanced by reason of, of the knowledge and the skill of the players. You don't have that right at the very beginning of, of play of a variant. But after a while, when the variant's been played, uh, let's say a few hundred times, people will, will notice this and they'll start to uh, start to compensate for, for this sort of thing. Well, that makes sense to me. And if we apply that, uh, that heuristic to the original diplomacy, maybe the reason why it feels relatively balanced is everybody's just played it so much, they know what to do. <laughs> Right. That's, of course, one of the reasons why I prefer to play variants is that everyone's played standard so much. You get a lot of players who I talked about this uh, with Kaner and Ambi on their show. I always bounce in Galicia as Russia. I always move to the Black Sea as Turkey. I never attack Italy when I'm France. Why? I don't know why, but you know they're rigid. They're rigid in their play, and in variants, there is no best opening. Nobody has seen twenty thousand, you know, games of worth of data in these variants, and, and therefore it's it's a lot fresher. People are forced to actually think about what they're doing instead of always moving Fleet Keel to Denmark in spring nineteen oh one. Because I think that's the best opening, and that's what I'm going to do every time. I really like your point there, and I, I promise I'm going to connect up to it. Are, are you familiar with another game published by the same publisher, Magic the Gathering? Yeah, I've never played it, but I'm, I'm familiar with it. For those of you listening who may not be familiar, it's a trading card game, but it's maybe like the Ur example being first released in, 19, in 1993 or something. It's been around for a long time, and a lot of the other trading card games that are out there in some way are paying homage to this game, Magic the Gathering, that's published by the same publisher as Diplomacy, Wizards of the Coast. And about every three to six months, they release completely new and different cards. And that's, I'm sure, to fuel their enterprise of selling people as many collectibles as they possibly can. Uh, but it has an interesting effect on the game, which is that because there's entirely new sets of cards that come out every couple of months, even though the rules are basically the same, the cards are different. And it forces you to think for yourself and think on your feet and come up with new strategies because the stuff that people did six months ago doesn't apply anymore because the cards are different. And I think there's a comparison here to what's interesting about playing diplomacy variants is that the same general concepts apply. Hey, if it's an eight player game, I need to make some allies and pick some enemies and if you're entering your move simultaneously, all right, I need to get a read on this other player. You can understand how supports work if it's a game that you know, basically works the same way as diplomacy, but you can't have a 
a memorized way of trying to play the game. There's not a cookie cutter strategy because it just doesn't have that level of attention given to it because it's relatively new. And that is ex- itself part of the fun. That's neat. Hey, we're playing this new map that no one's ever played before. So I don't know what a good strategy is. I have to really, <laughs> I have to really think about it the way that people who played diplomacy for the first time would have had to apprehend the map and try to make sense of it. Just as a, by the way, there's a word I have for people who uh, always play the same opening in, in standard diplomacy as well. But, you know, if this is a PG show, I'm not going to use it. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is a PG show, but I, I take your diplomacy. point. Let me put it that way. Very bad in diplomacy. It's a good way. It's a good way to lose the game. Something that I like on a higher level, I guess, maybe like a game design level that I've learned from playing diplomacy variants is how some of the variants whittle down the original game to some very simple aspect and are still a pretty interesting game. For example, the idea of the 1v1 variants, which has the original classic map, and you just pick exactly two powers exist, all the rest of the centers are treated as neutral, and you play against one other player. And at first glance, this seems like, how could this be a game at all, right? Diplomacy is a game where you're supposed to be talking and negotiating and making deals. And well, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a great part of the game. But actually layered into that is simply trying to tactically outplay another player and guess where they're going to move and make the counter moves. That's taking place in diplomacy all the meanwhile. And so by whittling down the game to just 1v1, we discovered there's still a game here. That's actually just this one simple mechanic of moving the pieces around and trying to guess what the other player to do. It's still a decent game. I agree that there's still a game there. I'm not personally sure whether I consider it to be decent as opposed to <laughs> elementary. I mean, for me personally, diplomacy tactics are the easiest part of the game. The hard part of the game, the challenging and rewarding part of the game is the diplomacy small d trying to influence the other players on the board. Tactics is just second nature. I can do that in my head. And I'm confident in my ability to, if not beat anybody, if if they're as good as me, I'll draw them. But for a lot of people I know, they they love tactics. So they play, you know, the Cold War variant or whatever. It's just just not my cup of tea at all. Understood. Uh, Maybe I'll contextualize my perspective on these 1v1 variants, which is I've introduced a lot of beginners to diplomacy, people who have not played the game before at all and are hoping to learn and they want to learn from me and they want to learn to be good. And I think that a decent technique for getting someone quickly up to speed on all the tactical stuff they need to know in order to play the game at a basic level is to play a couple of 1v1 matches on the classic map like I'm talking about. So, hey, you know, you do France versus Austria, Germany versus Italy. Mm-hmm. You play right. three or five of those. Okay, now I understand how all the support orders work. I understand how I can't overcome certain defenses. Right. I understand the importance right. of my home as, as a teaching tool for a beginner, that's great. But, I, you know, I haven't been a beginner since 1980. So, again, not my cup of tea. I'd rather be playing, you know, against a bunch of people at once so that I can play the fun part of the game, if you know what I mean. Not that, not that tactics isn't fun, but comparatively, it's just not a challenge. The challenge is beating the opponent's plans rather than the, you know, okay, I, I guessed right and I, I, you know, I was able to crack his line or something like that. Because a lot of the time, if you've got a couple of very skilled players, it just sort of comes down to a few guesses as to which one of those players is going to be the winner And that's okay. There's a modicum of skill in guessing right, but you know, ultimately, it's some coin flips. Well, do you like the variants that increase the number of players that can play from beyond the original seven? I tend to like larger variants. I've designed a bunch, although the latest variant that I'm working on is in fact a six player variant rather than the seven. But yeah, I mean, I I get a kick out of very large variants. Uh, it's just sort of fun to interact with, you know, a dozen or two dozen people. The last large variant that I did is called Dawn of the Enlightenment. And uh, again, that brought in a lot of what I talked about. It is less dense. It's a wraparound map. There's chaos builds. Additionally, uh, a lot of the powers have supply centers all over the globe since it represents the world as of 1701. So... Even if you were one of the smaller powers that's only in one area of the map, for example, China, probably the most isolated power on that map, 
China has neighbors among them, Portugal, Spain, India, Russia, probably uh, the Netherlands. And if you've got those neighbors, you're basically going to be talking with everybody else anyway, because, you know, if Portugal is attacking you, you know, maybe you want to talk to, uh, you know, India about attacking the Portuguese centers in in Asia, or maybe you want to talk to France about attacking the uh, Portuguese centers in South America. You're basically forced to talk to everybody if you want to have a good game. I've heard some good things about that variant. I have not had the opportunity to play myself. Right now, it's hand adjudication only. It's being worked on to be added to VDIP. But uh, yeah, right now, if you want to play Dawn of the Enlightenment, you better find a GM who's willing to put in the work. So actually, I think that's a pretty interesting thing to mention. VDIP is one of the websites that puts the effort into coding in a lot of the variants that exist out there. And so most of the websites that people play diplomacy on have only a handful of maps like Backstabber, I think, only has just the one. I believe Backstabber is standard uh, map only. And then the website's pretty popular, but like VDIP's got, I don't know, maybe more than 50 variants? Is it more than 100? I think it's well over 100, actually. Yeah. PlayDip has a few, although I think you have to be a premium member there. WebDip has a few. Some of the apps have some. Uh, Conspiracy has some. Duplicity has a few. The new app that's out there called Primacy, they're aiming to have a whole ton of variants because their code is based upon porting the old Realpolitik variants over. And Realpolitik was an adjudicator that was variant friendly. So there are a few dozen old variants that are on Realpolitik that I believe Primacy is uh, aiming to bring in. A lot of platforms out there these days. Yeah, that's true. There's no shortage of apps that you can use to play diplomacy. I think it's really fun just to look at some of these maps and try to make sense of them and figure out what someone was thinking when they made it up or how they handled some weird geographic situation. I think that can be pretty interesting. Like on the classic diplomacy map, there's uh, a few provinces that are completely weird, like Kiel and Constantinople, that if you play diplomacy a lot, you sort of take it for granted. But for someone who's looking at the map for the first time and trying to figure out how those provinces work, it's quite cryptic. And uh, they basically have their own little special rules or the idea of the separate coasts on Bulgaria and Spain, for instance. I like finding out like, hey, you know, how did this person, when they're designing the map, how do they handle, you know, the Suez Canal? How is that working out? You know, it's something that's significant in real life geography. How, how does it function in the game? Does it work like Kiel or is it something more complicated? Or uh, in North American maps, uh, sometimes they'll make complicated river stuff that you can do. I've seen that once or twice, which is not something that exists on the original map. All right. That's something that I've run into in my variant design history. One variant that seems to be fairly popular out there of mine is Known World 901, which is basically the Eastern Hemisphere as of 901 A.D., And for that, what I uh, did was, as an aid to movement, long before there was a Suez Canal, the pharaohs actually had a canal which linked the Nile and the Red Sea. It had fallen into disrepair for the last time, maybe a couple of hundred years before that. But the memory of that was still around. And basically, the original game mechanic was that uh, if you wanted to use up what would otherwise be a build, you could reopen it so that you could transfer a fleet in Egypt from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea and then out into the Indian Ocean. So instead of Egypt acting like a Bulgaria that had two coasts or a St. Petersburg that had two coasts, it would act like Constantinople. And you just had to pay a uh, one center uh, penalty, so to speak. I actually do have several variants as well, which use rivers as a way of opening up more land-oriented maps to more fleet action to increase the importance of fleets. A lot of the world isn't really conducive to fleet-oriented variants. Uh, Europe has some fortuitous geography, and that's replicated in some other places around the world, but 
a lot of places you, you don't have that sort of irregular coast that lends itself to a lot of fleet play. You know, that raises an interesting question in my mind. Why do we want to design maps based on real geography or historical scenarios? There are a few reasons. Number one, typically, if you want to design variants based upon fantasy or ahistorical scenarios, like, you know, the classic Lord of the Rings variants or Game of Thrones variants or something like that, you run into intellectual property issues. A variant designer or a platform is not going to want to put in the work and put out a variant there if the lawyers for uh, Tolkien's estate you know, send you a cease and desist letter. You're not going to see a Lord of the Rings variant anytime soon. The exception would be if you got permission from an author, then you could do it. But that's not the easiest thing in the world to do, obviously. They're concerned about their intellectual property. They may not want to be associated, their works to be associated with diplomacy. And the other side of the coin is history can give you some good ideas, and, and also it tends to attract a player base. If you do a historical variant, you're going to have people who are interested in that particular part of history, they're going to be more likely to give your variant a try. For example, the variant that I'm currently developing and playing in a play test is called Unconstitutional. It's uh, Eastern North America as of 1800, presuming that the Constitution never got ratified. So it's got several, uh, several states in the United States are among the powers. So for someone with an interest in the American Revolutionary War or early American history might be interested in that. I don't want to constantly toot my own horn, so I'll, I'll throw some other people in there, too. If you were uh, interested in, let's say, uh, Japanese medieval history, you might want to play uh, Ben Hester's Sengoku variant. I think that's a really good insight because a lot of people that I have met, and I'm including myself in this, got interested in diplomacy for being interested in history. I was a fan of history first, and I was studying history in college, and another history student that I met in college wanted to play diplomacy. I thought, oh, cool, this is neat. Uh, we're learning about this sort of thing in our school, and uh, this has some some relevance. Now, hey, this like ancient stuff sounds like I have to think about it firsthand. And even a lot of teachers in, in high schools, for instance, will try to use diplomacy to teach students something for me the connection to a historical scenario and trying to like think about that, to contemplate old geopolitics mm -hmm. is part of the fun. And I, I know that some people play diplomacy purely as a, as a game or the, there's a lot of mathematicians that play and they, they don't really care about that aspect of the game most of the time. But time and again, I think that the variants that are interesting or that, that are well regarded do have some bearing in history. I mean, you mentioned, uh, you didn't care to play the Cold War variant, which is a one-on-one -on -one game. But I think it bears mentioning that somebody wanted to imagine, hey, how can I make a variant of diplomacy that's a one-on-one -on -one scenario? I know, the Cold War, that was a political uh, you know, intrigue where it was just one side against another side, or at least it's mm -hmm. imagined yeah. to be for the game. And so instantly, uh, if you have some knowledge of modern history, you understand what the game uh, you know, is inspired by or what it's about or what the map might look like without, without even having to, to see a picture of it. You can kind of imagine in your mind's eye, okay, I can kind of see, you know, it's probably Warsaw versus NATO or something. Right. And it's not just students either. Uh, there are militaries out there that use diplomacy as a training tool, not even unofficially, but officially as a training tool. In fact, this wasn't an official game, but I was shocked to find out that a group of six West Point cadets were playing a game of unconstitutional, and I didn't even organize it. I found out about it, and I observed their game. And they kept calling me Sir and Mr. Cohen. <laughs> I forget the precise number, but there's a, a World Diplomacy variant map that's available on Web Diplomacy. I think it's called like World Diplomacy 9 or something. It's referring to the version history of the map. I don't remember precisely. Right. There are several of them out there. That's, that is one of them. I have played this a few times, and what I really enjoy about this particular variant map is that it's totally global in scale. It's huge. It's got like 17 players on it, and uh, otherwise it's relatively very simple, mostly following the original rules of diplomacy as much as possible. The only thing that's kind of uh, it's lacking in Zaz because the countries are just made up. 
They're totally just artificially imagined countries for the purposes of making up a balanced game. It's not based in history. Yeah, once you lose the history, you lose a lot of the sort of background flavor. It's more difficult for me to get into it if it doesn't have the historical background. I, You know, obviously, playability is ultimately king, but I strive to bring in that historical, you know, flavor. There are perfectly balanced diplomacy variants out there which are not popular. You have five Italy's. That's one of them where you have sort of the Italian peninsula welded together at the top, you know, in a pentagonal fashion. Or there is, of course, pure, which is where everybody has one supply center that borders all of the other supply centers. Perfectly balanced. Neither variant is terribly popular. Uh, and I think that is because it's lacking in flavor. It doesn't have the historical value. Each power isn't unique in standard than in your typical variant. The, the powers are, they have different capabilities. England, you're going to typically have a lot of fleets. Austria, you're going to work with a lot of armies. Russia, you're going to be hopefully active in, in several different areas of the board. Whereas if you're playing five Italy's, everybody is, everybody starts with exactly the same starting position and there's no variation there, and it's not as much fun for a lot of people. I agree. I like playing in the same game in some kind of asymmetrical scenario. Like a lot of video games, for instance, will have different characters you can play with different abilities. And diplomacy, although superficially the powers usually seem very, these are almost the same, right? They just have a couple of armies or whatever, and you move them around. But their geographic position can change everything so where you have to play you have to think totally differently like uh, or, or to compare it to the the historical learning that we've talked about you can read about german diplomatic concerns geopolitical problems in the 1800s and they say like you know i think we're being diplomatically encircled okay well if you play diplomacy and you get assigned germany you'll understand this in a second because germany was born encircled <laughs> okay I, I see what's going on here you have to think a certain way or the game compels you to think differently based on which power you've been assigned. And I think that's really fun and interesting. It means you can play the same game over and over, but if you play it with, the, if you get assigned a different power, uh, you think about the game differently. And if you've got a variant that's got, say, you know, a dozen different countries you could play, you could play it a dozen times and still feel like you're playing it for the first time. Even if you're playing with all the same people. Yeah. Obviously, if you're playing with different groups of people each time, that gives you even more variety. But even if you play the same seven people, play standard diplomacy once a week or something like that, the, as long as the powers get shuffled around, the, the experience is going to be different each time. One thing that I'm particularly interested in and have never had a chance to do is I want to play, what the heck is it called, the Fog of War variant which is something that you wouldn't be able to play on a physical board. You would need to have a computer or a game master or somebody because the information that's available to you and what's happening on the board is limited. So each player, I'm sure you've played more familiar with it, right? Uh, yeah, I'm familiar with Fog of War, yes. There's whole, all sorts of variations of Fog of War as well. In fact, there are variants out there. They're obviously one-off variants where it's not only Fog of War, but it's a map that's specifically invented for that particular game. No one even knows what the outline, so to speak, of the map looks like. If Whoa. you're playing Fog of War on the standard map, you know, you may not know who's in St. Petersburg, but you know St. Petersburg is up there. There are people who have designed one-off maps where, you know, they plunk you down in a supply center and you not only don't know what's going on, you know, three spaces away to the northeast. There may not even be three spaces away to the northeast. You just don't know. You have to go there to find out or talk to people and let them tell you, and which they may be lying about, of course. That sounds awesome. I had not heard of that before. That sounds really cool. Yeah, obviously that's a human adjudicated item. <laughs> uh, that's not going to be uh, run on your regular uh, diplomacy platform. I promise this is connected. Are you familiar with Settlers of Catan? Yeah, I've, I've played it in the past. I haven't played it too often, but yes. Okay. Yeah, that, obviously the map changes every time there because it's you deal out the tiles and you have a many. 
many different possible combinations of maps there. That's exactly what I was thinking. And to expound on that a little bit, that game's got a gazillion expansions that you might, we might use the term variant to refer to these different expansions that are available to the game. But one that I really like mm-hmm. is a version where um, a rule set, I forget the name of it, but you need the Seafarers expansion to play it, where you put a little border of water around the starting island. And then if you sail off, you lay down new tiles uh, during the gameplay because you discover new land that's beyond the island. And that's probably my number one favorite way to play Settlers of Catan. And so your story about playing a variant of diplomacy where you sort of discover the map while you play sounds like so much fun. Right. Again, that's a lot of work for a GM. <laughs> yeah, I uh, bet. There, there are, of course, also games out there which, you know, whether you want to call them diplomacy variants or not, they border on diplomacy where there are no maps at all. I designed a game many years ago that emulates forming a government in a parliamentary democracy where you negotiate with other political parties uh, and you assign ministries to them and there are points assigned to that. To make it interesting, you have certain ministries that you in secret assign more value to. So nobody has all of the information as to how valuable the ministries are. And, you know, you attempt to form a government and then everybody sort of adds up their points. And the kicker is that each of the political parties has a different number of members of parliament. And you have a multiplier so that the smallest party will get its point score multiplied by a much larger number than the largest party. So that evens out. I'm the little party. I, I, you know, I only have one ministry, but I only have 10 members of parliament. So my score is multiplied by 10 compared to the party that has 100 members of parliament. I see. That's been played a few times. It's arguably a diplomacy variant, but not really because there's no map. But it equates to simultaneous movement. People can lie to each other. It's just in a different milieu. Well, that sounds awesome. Since I, I have myself pondered about ways to replicate the political aspects of diplomacy without needing to understand the board. It sounds like that variant or whatever, this game that you designed yourself uh, with that idea in mind. I can shoot it over to you. It's, it's a pretty simple rule set. It sounds awesome. Like one of my favorite games, hands down, is the original rules for the game Mafia, which has a bazillion different ways of playing. And then it's mostly been learned by word of mouth. There are a bunch of cloned versions of that game out there. I've heard of it. I've never played Mafia. Oh, wow. Okay, so in its purest form, it's a simple limited information game in which there are two teams. And about one third of the players know which team that they're on the Mafia team. And two thirds of the players know that they are on that they are on the uh, the team of the citizens or whatever. They're just they're not the Mafia. The job of the citizen players is to discover who's in the Mafia. The Mafia know who's in the Mafia. Their job is to remain concealed. The game alternates between a phase that can be called the daytime, in which everyone discusses who should be voted out of the game, and a night phase in which the mafia just decide to eliminate somebody. And so uh, the game goes turn after turn, whittling players off until either the mafia remain or the citizens remain. And the gameplay, uh, if you keep it this simple, if you keep it pure, <laughs> it's a really simple game. You don't even really need any anything to play it. You just need some way to randomize who's on which team. And that's it. Then you can start playing. I love that. You can play it on you know, a school bus or in a backyard or, or wherever. And uh, for a while, my family, my extended family, we play matches with a dozen or even two dozen people. Some of our friends came over. It was a really cool game, a really fun game. And obviously it is because social deduction games are now a top type of game. Many of them inspired by Mafia. The video game Among Us is heavily inspired by this type of game. My context for this is sometimes when I'm trying to get people interested in diplomacy, I try to tell them, you like social deduction games, right? It's pretty fun. Okay, imagine like it's like a social deduction game where you know that everybody is kind of out to get you at least some of the time. Everybody's on their own team. Uh, but sometimes you have to work together and that's kind of shifting all the time. It's, it's really fun. If you like a social deduction game like Mafia or Werewolf or Among Us, maybe you'll really like diplomacy because it's a little more complex. 
that'll get them interested sometimes. Like, wow, it's even more challenging or more complex than simply, you know, two sides and trying to figure out who's on the other side. Yeah. 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 Turn turn by turn, (laughs) maybe even in the middle of a turn, somebody might've changed sides on you and uh, you got to figure that out. And that's just a small part of diplomacy. Returning to my earlier point about, I like how some variants focus down on one aspect of diplomacy. I like the idea of a game that simplifies the gameplay to just the political aspects or as much as possible in order to, um, you know, just to eliminate how that can be interesting, even without the board, that's just still an interesting game in itself. All right. And there, there are, of course, variants that have very complex rule sets where you have political type interaction overlaying the usual diplomacy uh, between nations. Baron Powell some of his variants have that. He's got a variant called College of Cardinals, which is a, a variant for, I think it's nine or 10 players in medieval times and sort of welded on top of the usual diplomacy stuff is uh, the Catholic powers have cardinals and they get to elect a pope who has, then the pope has certain powers that uh, are, you can influence the game with. It adds a, a big layer of complexity, but some people like that sort of thing. And that's just an example that sort of dovetails into what you're talking about. I think for me, in what finally like brings me to be willing to try a variant is that I really want to find out how the game plays out with the rule that's different, or the rule, the, the different rule possibly being the map itself. But like, okay, you know, if I'm playing this map that's got 13 players and it's got this structure, but otherwise it's the same rules. But what are the implications? You know, are fleets any good? Are they better than usual or should I? I don't know. All these, these questions that are raised and I, I want to explore that. It makes me feel young again. Like when I was first learning diplomacy and how fun it was to figure out, okay, you know, actually I can afford to you know, give up Belgium. I don't really need it. It's not technically that valuable, but I, at the beginning I thought it was. And I'm past, way past all that stuff now, but for a new map, uh, I got to learn it all over again. Yes. All right. Well, we've come to the end of our scheduled time for the Diplomacy Dojo. Thanks for, for coming and hanging out with me, fellas. Oh, it was interesting yeah. listening to the variant stuff. Oh, yeah. First time hearing about it. Thank you. It was fun. All right. See you around. Bye, guys. This episode was made possible by the generous support of people like you. For more information, visit patreon.com slash brotherboard. You can learn more from your board brother at brotherboard.com. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe, share, and review. Thanks to Loyalty Freak Music for the theme music, It Feels Good to Be Alive too.